Hey, welcome church family. It's time for a great message. God prepared this directly for you. So get prepared, strap in, because it's about to get exciting. We'll see you after the message. Amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our service today. Today is a special Sunday because it's the fifth Sunday of the month. And on the fifth Sunday of the month, we have the kids in our service. So uh, all the kids from children's ministry and everything are in our service today. And, and uh, for some of you, you may think, well, that's, that's kind of odd. But let me tell you, God blessed us with children. Children are a blessing to each and every one of us. And, and as that blessing, God has given us the responsibility to raise them up in the knowledge and admiration of God. And so to do that, we like to bring them in here because one day it's our goal and our prayer that each and every child is a part of our regular service. Amen? Amen? They need to get used to this. Now, now to, to kind of help the kids out, though, we have a thing that we do on the first, uh, on the fifth Sunday of every month. We have a worksheet. If you do not have a worksheet, you need to stand up right now. If you don't have a worksheet, because let me tell you about the worksheet. If you have a worksheet and you fill that worksheet out, at the end of the service, you can go see Jill right over here. Here's Jill. If you don't have a worksheet, get a worksheet. Um, if you'll see Jill after service, and turn in that worksheet, you'll get a dollar bill for every one, every answer you have correct. Okay, up to five dollars. There's six questions on there, so you can get one wrong, okay? But um, uh, the first time we did this, a young man came up to me and said, you, you know, five dollars doesn't buy very much today. A lot of places I go with that, but uh, here's where we're going. Uh, that's what you get today, okay? Five bucks. I mean, a dollar for every correct answer. And so, if you don't have a if you don't have a questionnaire there, get one. Or a, our worksheet there, get one. And uh, uh, it's it's really truly is our anticipation to see these young people transition from children's ministry into an adult service. We lose kids today, and, and this isn't part of my message. I probably ought to go ahead and start my timer and everything. We lose kids today because a lot of times we just allow them to be kids for way too long. Men, I'm speaking to some of you. You realize that uh, uh, the average age of a man coming to maturity now has, has reached into the 40s? That's ridiculous, isn't it? We'll review those questions at the end of service, get with Jill, and, and get paid off on that, okay? All right. Today we're um, uh, back in the book of Nehemiah, and so if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Nehemiah, we'll be there uh, most of the time. We do have a few other scriptures, and, I, and I'm confident I will not get to all the scriptures that I put out there, but if you uh, have the Bible app that we have here and you can download the scriptures onto your tablet or onto your iPhone, uh, you can be able to follow along, along that way, but most of the time we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 9 today. Nehemiah chapter 9, and this means that we're, we're uh, uh, probably close to two-thirds through the book of Nehemiah. That means that we only have uh, uh, four Maybe five more weeks of, of Nehemiah left, and then we'll transition into our next series. But I've been, I've been blessed by the book of Nehemiah. I hope you have too. And today, as we continue the book of Nehemiah, this possibly is the longest recorded prayer in the Bible, the chapter 9 of Nehemiah. This prayer co covers the history of God's people from Abraham to the current events that took place in Nehemiah chapter 9. So this is a long prayer to go back all the way to Abraham to, to the current events. I don't know how any prayer, uh, I don't know how you pray. Let me, let me put it this way. I don't know how you pray, but I pray through a form of verbal processing. And, and if, you don't, if you don't have a real good prayer language or you don't, you're not real good at, at communicating with God, start verbal processing to God. 
You say, does he want to hear all that? Yes, he does. He would enjoy hearing from you more often. And so even this morning on my way to uh, church here, uh, early in the morning I'm driving, there's no traffic, and, and, and uh, I begin to verbal process the prior week and few days. And, and I walk through all the things that happened. I bring, uh, I bring the history to him. I bring, I bring the good things that have happened. I bring the bad things that have happened. I, I start thinking about situations in my life, and I, and I tell God what I think should happen from, from this point forward. I, I also try to bring in God's word into it. I know your word says this, Lord, but you know what? I want to do this, Lord. Have you ever been there? You know what? Many times as I'm praying, as I'm verbal processing, he corrects me. He bring, I bring the history in, and then, then I bring what I think in, and then, then what, what his word says, and then what I'd like to do. And then many times as I tell him what I'd like to do, he once again shows me how foolish I can be. Have you ever been there? Have you ever said, God, this needs to be handled this way, and God's voice comes to your heart and says, no, this is the way you should handle this. I'll tell you, we'd be much better off if we verbal processed some things before we just reacted and responded. How much better off you would be and I would be if we took a few minutes to verbal process what has happened, what God's Word says, and what we want to do, and then kind of figure out what God wants us to do. Amen. See, many of you have been raised in, in families and situations where you were a counterpuncher. Some of you are looking at me and saying, what's that mean, a counterpuncher? Some of you haven't been into that. But let me tell you, when somebody taps you, you hit them. You, you, don't, you don't think, you, do, you just respond. So many times, it's so important to go to prayer and get the proper response from God. And so prayer is exactly that. Prayer also uh, really reveals who you are and where you are in your relationship with God. A lot of times you can pray and, and we can tell by your prayers where you're at in your relationship with God. Is, is prayer a struggle for you? Now, I can tell you this. Uh, as I pray a lot of times, a lot of things that I say in my prayers probably won't make a lot of sense to you. But let me tell you, they're making sense to God. He understands. He knows what I've went through. Not, not all the time physically because the same thing can happen to each and every one of us, but a different emotional response can be within each and every one of us. And so what we need to do is we, we need to remember prayer is something that is between you and God. And if you can't pray, then is there truly a good relationship between you and God? Now we have those people that, that say these wonderful prayers we have, we have people that have these magnificent words. And let me tell you, God does not have a trigger word he's looking for for you to say, and then he has to pay attention to you. Okay? That's not the way it is. He loves you just how he created you. And he wants to communicate with you regularly, all the time. He wants to hear your, your issues, your problems. He wants to help you through things. But he, you know what he wants more than anything? He wants to realize where you've come from, where you are, and where you're going. A lot of times we pray for just where we are right now instead of going back and seeing what got me here. So many times you are where you are today because of the actions, reactions, thoughts, and ideas that you had before you arrived right here. It's not God's fault that you have all the issues that you may have. It's a lot of times your fault. The sin that you've allowed into your life, the, the areas of your life that, you've, that you haven't surrendered to God and, you've, and you've, let, you've let the world control or you've let demonic forces control. And you're in the place you're at because of it. And it's so important as you verbal process to God to bring up the past. All the way to the present. And then seek guidance for the future. A lot of times we just pray when everything else has failed. It's like that back in the uh, day when, when people were trying to stop smoking cigarettes, they, they would sell these cigarettes in a glass tube that said, in case of emergency break. And that's where you are with your prayers. In case of emergency, I'm going to pray. No. Your prayer life needs to be something that is powerful and reflective and current 
and futuristic. And Nehemiah is walking us through it, turning a dead religion into a dynamic religion. You've got to remember, 141 years, the Jewish people, as we start off early in the book of Nehemiah, and found out they'd been 141 years without walls and without a temple. So, so their, their religion had become dead. They were, they were still practicing certain aspects of it. They were still a, a nation of sorts, but in reality, they were not they were not practicing with any zeal or urgency. They were, they were spiritually dead. Today, we have a lot of people going to churches and even coming at this time to this church that, that are spiritually dead. And I'm not looking at anybody, I'm just saying we get to that point in our life sometimes where we just don't have the zeal or the excitement for the things of God. And it's important to grab that zeal again to realize that God is everything. And that's what these people did in Nehemiah chapter 9. For 141 years, they had practiced religion that, could, that we could almost say was a dead religion, somewhat spiritual, but had no zeal and had no urgency. What's the difference between a dead religion and a dynamic religion? Well, let's l- list some of them right away. First, a dead religion. A dead religion has external, uh, not internal. Dead religions are external and not internal. They, they, they are for man's approval or man to see and not for God to see. They are, they are not changing us. They are, they're not changing your true self. They're just, they're just something that we do to, to make us feel holy or make other people think that we're holy and righteous. There's, there's, there's no spirituality without the Holy Spirit. And that's what a dead religion is. They have spirituality, but there's no power of the Holy Spirit in that religion. A dynamic revival is this. There is sacrifice. And let me tell you, true revival requires sacrifice. Sacrifice. There's change. If you want reviving of your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul, of this church, of the work on the hill, then there has to be, there has to be sacrifice and there has to be change. You'll find with change there comes emotional worship. I'm talking weeping and and, and kneeling before the Lord. You say, oh, I don't get into that emotional stuff. And I know a lot of people just are too emotional. Let me tell you, I know. But, But let me tell you this. When you come into the presence... The holy and righteous God. I love that song. When I, when I come in his presence, I don't know whether I'll kneel or I'll bow or I'll dance or what I'm going to do. Let me tell you, I'm going to kneel. I'm going to kneel in the holy presence of God because he is holy and I am unholy. The opposite of holy, that's what I am. The only thing that brings me any righteousness or holiness is Jesus Christ in me. And the sacrifice that he's made and the covering that he's provided for me. And so there's, there's some emotional change. There's, there's sacrifice, there's change, there's emotional worship, there's Bible reading. Let me tell you, the Bible is important. It's the inspired word of God. It's something that we should be living under, not over, and not beside and so true revival or dynamic revival will, will, will be created through Bible reading. And I want us to read the Bible. We have several people that have read the Bible through this year or are trying to read the Bible through this year. It's an important thing to do. It's not too late to get started. Your year, your year Bible could start today. Get God's Word in your heart. You won't be deceived as easily if you know God's Word. Then there's prayer. Let me tell you, prayer is a vital part of dynamic revival. I don't know, how many of you prayed before you came to this service today? How many prayed for this service? Don't raise your hand, just think about it. Some of you are shaking your head, some of you are amen. How many prayed for me today? I know know there were some that maybe prayed, uh, put an anointing on Tracy and keep it under 45 minutes, Lord. Some of, you fr- prayed, some of you prayed the right prayer, and that is, let him free, set him free. Do what he wants, do what you want him to do, Lord. <laughs> but here it is. It is prayer. It takes prayer. And this is a very important part of dynamic rep- revival. It's repentance. Repentance. Jonathan Edwards 
one of, if not the greatest American theologian. In 1734, one of the famous sermons that he preached was this, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And you know what? Thousands of people were transformed and great revival came because Jonathan Edwards spoke the truth. And today, we've revised it. It's God in the hands of angry sinners. Rather than changing us, we want to change God. Jonathan Edwards said, no, we do not change God. God changes us. He gave five marks of true revival. Number one, it exalts Jesus Christ. Number two, it, 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 it uh, attacks the power of darkness. Number three, it, it, it exalts the holy scriptures. And number four, it lifts up sound doctrine. And number five, it promotes love to God and to man. Those are the five marks of true revival. We could go through history, and I could mention other great men of God. I could mention George Whitfield and D.L. Moody and, and others, and, and I could go back to even more recent things that we just, a lot of us see a movie not too long ago, the Jesus Movement. I could go back to the Jesus Movement. There was a time where a bunch of young people were confused. Do we live in that time today? Oh, it seems like history just keeps repeating itself. As I told you about the Bible, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened, just what happened. It tells us what always happens. It just keeps repeating. In the Jesus movement, a minister by the name of Chuck Smith was very vital in the, in the starting up of, of that great move of God amongst teenagers. It was the Vietnam War was going on. There was gender confusion. There was, there was sex, drugs, rock and roll. There was, there was uh, uh, Eastern demonic religions being taught and practiced by, by young people all over America. It was econ there was an economic collapse. There were hippies. We don't call them hippies today. I, I was reading something the other day, and I, and I began to realize, you know, uh, when, we, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, boy, I shouldn't have said that. Some of you are, are doing the math right now to see how old he really may be. When I was growing up, and some of you are thinking, that, cause that's a young guy up there talking to us right now. Yeah, I know, I'm, the two, the two spectrums here. But when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, you know what, I, it, you, had the, you had the dope freaks and the, and the weirdo people, and I gotta tell you, we become the weirdo people. I mean, I mean good, moral, straight people today are the, are the weirdo people, it seems like. But Chuck Smith and, and, and his, his little tiny church, they first didn't want to accept these, these young people that were coming in, and ultimately, uh, ultimately Chuck Smith had to take a stand and say, no, we're preaching the Word of God. They struggle with authority, so we're going to start preaching through the Word of God. No more topical scripture uh, sermons. We're going to preach through the Word of God, and these people are going to see that the authority is found in Jesus Christ and God's Word, and we're going to preach it, and it's going to change it, and it transformed their life and it started a Jesus movement that today still there are people that have been affected in the church of Jesus Christ today by that movement. Amen. We need another great revival. Amen. With every great revival you will find repentance though. There is no great revival unless there is the gift of repentance. Now, some of you look at me and say, what do you mean gift of repentance? Let me tell you, it is a gift from God for us to be able to repent. I know, you say, well, I don't see that listed anywhere. Let me tell you, we want the gift of repentance here. We want the gift of repentance. It's a gift that's been given to you by God to bring you into relationship with him because there is no salvation apart from repentance and belief. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now, on the 20th, 24th day of, of the month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and, and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of, God, uh, law of the Lord their God for... 
a quarter of the day. That's a few hours. And for another quarter of the day, they made confession. They prayed. That's another few hours. And worship God. And worship the Lord their God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast track or give you a paraphrased version of Nehemiah chapter 9. Please follow along and stay with me if you can. And, and we'll get some, to some other scriptures here in just a little while. But, but listen, the people... The people. Revival can't happen without people that are willing to come. And these people came with sackcloth and ashes. It says they, they, they assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and earth on their heads. They were in a form of saying, we are lowly. We cannot do anything without God. They stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. They made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. Our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks. They committed great blasphemy. They were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law before, behind their backs and killed your prophets. They committed great blasphemy. They did evil against you or, or, or again before you. They just kept doing evil before him. They acted acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules. They turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their necks and would not obey. They would not give ear. We acted wickedly, they say. Our kings and our princes, our priests and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you have given them, that you gave them. They did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. They, we, are slaves because of our sin. See, we don't realize that today. We don't realize, we, we, don't come, we haven't come to this real, we, we think our freedom is being able to do whatever we want. And let me tell you, our freedom is, is not in doing what you want. Our true freedom is found in doing what God created us to do and be. By you doing whatever you want, you, you, are, performing, you are performing the acts that, that sin and Satan wants to be performed in your life. See, once sin is exposed in our life, you have these options. Once sin is ex exposed in your life, you have these options. One, we can deny it. How many, how many has ever been there? How many, how many has been caught in sin or a sin and denied that sin in your life? You can deny sin. You, you, can, you can say, oh, that wasn't me. You, you mistook what I was doing or what I said. You can, you, can try to, you can try to sweep it under the rug and deny that it ever happened. Today, we deny sin on a regular basis. But what's more popular today for us to do is option number two. We can celebrate our sin. And, and we have a whole month designed just for celebrating sin. And, and that, that's, that's wrong also. So when you, when you have sin exposed, you can deny it, you can, you, can, uh, you can celebrate it, which is wrong, or you can blame somebody else for it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever seen that? Uh, uh, it was Shelly's fault. That's my sister, Shelly. Growing up, yeah, Shelly, she, she, it's her fault. Or she'd point at me, it's my fault. We'll have to have a conversation later to see who did that the most. But we can blame others. I'm, I'm this way because of this. And we have, we have, a, we have, a, populate, we have a, a large number in our population today that are blaming others and trying to receive something for that because they want to continue in the sin that others have done to them in their life. We've got to stop blaming. We've got to stop blaming. And, and then, we have, then we have the excuse. There's always an excuse. You have excuses. I have excuses. We, we all have excuses for our sin. Uh, uh, it, it, and some, some excuses come in the way, I was raised this way. I, I, I was ra this, is, this is just a habit that I have. Uh, uh, I, I, was, I was born this way. We, could, we can excuse everything away 
That's one of your options. Another option is to change the subject. <laughs> something, something happens, and uh, I get caught in, in doing something wrong. Mom, I got a really bad headache. And instead of, instead of getting on to me, she's trying to figure out why I got a bad headache. Some of you have children like that, right? You know what that's like? Change the subject, change the subject. And then you can always shoot the messenger. We're famous at that. But here's what you should do. Here's the best option for you when you're caught in sin. Repent. 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 Turn from your sin. Turn away from your sin. In this chapter alone, we, we see five times where it says we. We sinned. We sin. We see 30 times where it says they sinned. It, it's, a, it's a generational thing. It's something that we've all been doing. But Jesus Christ and his message to the world, he says we need to repent and believe. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says there, and now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, Jesus Christ has come after John to proclaim the true gospel of the kingdom. And he says this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Nehemiah and the people show this in their prayer. Sin is a personal and generational, uh, is personal and generational, and it must be repented of personally. You have Abraham. How many remember Abraham and his son Isaac? You know, the generational sin that was passed on from Abraham to, to Isaac was Abraham on two different occasions. What did he say about his wife? Oh, she's my sister. And so, you know what happens when Isaac comes along? Oh, my dad did this. I'll just keep doing this. See, that's another excuse for us to continue in our sin. It was okay for dad to do it, so I'm going to do it. No, my girls, listen to me right now. If I, if I, when I have sinned, <laughs> doesn't give you permission to continue in my sin. in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 20 and Genesis 26 you can find that story the people of Nehemiah the nation that has come back together 50,000 people have flooded Jer Jerusalem and, and they've, they've had a great revival they've had a great seven day uh, uh, Bible school they, they, they truly have come with sackcloth and ashes they've realized where they are and who they are and they've repented of their sins they're repenting of their sins and there is no salvation without repentance. Martin Luther, in his 95 thesis, began with this very first one. It says this, when our, when, when our Lord and Master Jesus said, repent, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. I missed that in my notes and in my, in my writing, so, so I looked it up here. It says in Matthew chapter 4, 17, from the time Jesus learned, or from the time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Martin Luther, he had been raised, he had been trained in a church that had begun to substitute repentance for penance and for cash deposits, and for cash donations, and for land, and for wealth, and for riches. And Martin Luther came with his very first thing is, repentance is needed first. The people in Nehemiah chapter 9 are repenting. For good to start, the bad must end. Before the church can straighten out the world, God must straighten out the church. Not, every, not everyone repents. And you've got to realize that even in the church of Jesus Christ, not everyone's going to repent. There's still always going to be the critics and enemies. We still have Sam Ballard. We still have Tobiah. We still have uh, 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 Geshem. We, we have these people that are never going to come to repentance. But what does he call us that want to be drawn into his presence? He wants us to repent and live lives of repentance. 
the demonic counterfeit to, to uh, repentance because as I've told you time after time, God create, whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. And today, all throughout history, we, we lose sight of this all the time, but ultimately, God's calling us to repent in repentance, and Satan has created a counterfeit to repentance, and it's tolerance. Wow, wow. Tolerance. Tolerance is the counterfeit of repentance. Satan comes, you know, here's, God says, God's word says, and name sin, and he says, repent of sin. You, you've heard me say this before, everything that God creates, Satan counterfeits, God's word names sins, and God says, you need to repent of that, and Satan comes along and says, no, 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 it, it's not about repentance, it's about tolerance. The demonic counterfeit of repentance definitely is tolerance today. The Bible only mentions the word tolerance a few times. It only occurs, I believe, in four different passages of Scripture. And it's always negative or pejorative. And never a good thing. Tolerance is never a good thing. I look back at the, I look at the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and, and, and John the Revelator, as he's, as he's given the word of God to us, he says, Jezebel is spoken about. Because we need to understand the Spirit's that, that were alive in the Old Testament are still alive in the New Testament and they're still demonically working in multiple generations. And he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. You and I are not to tolerate sin, but to repent of sin. We are not to accept sin, but reject sin. We are not to celebrate sin, but we're to, what? Crucify sin in our lives. And we can't be Christians if we tolerate our own sin in our life. You can only be a Christian if you repent of your sin. The reason that people struggle with repentance is because they don't think that they can change. And I'll tell you, you can't change but God can change you. God can truly change you. You don't need to celebrate who you are. Uh, you, don't need to, you don't need to hide who you are. You don't need to tolerate who you are. You need to confess who you are and let God change who you are. What I love in this story is that it's all focused on God. What I love about the ninth chapter is it's all about God. Up to this point, God has, has just been a fleeting thought in their mind for generations. It's been, yeah, we serve God. We serve God the creator. We don't, we don't know his power. We're living in exile. We're in slavery. Uh, we don't understand it, but yeah, we, we kind of serve God. And, and not a committed idea. And, and Nehemiah has come, and, and Ezra the prophet has come, and here's what he says. Now we have to be committed to God. The lengthy prayer that is prayed in chapter 9 is totally God-centered. Verse 6 says this, You are the Lord, you alone have made the heavens and the earth, or the heavens and the heaven of heavens, with all their host and the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. All through the remainder of this, path, or this chapter, we're going to be introduced to God in a powerful way. Here, here's some of them. God is eternal. The, the Lord, our God, from everlasting to everlasting, our God is eternal. There's no beginning, there's no end. He is the creator of all things. The, the, the only God, Him alone, him alone, he's the creator of everything. The heavens, the heavens, the earth, all creatures, all creation, all are about him. He sustains everything in, those, in just those verses right there, just that sixth verse right there. He sustains everything. You preserve all. Without him, we would not even be here today. He sustains all. He's worshiped by angels. If you go down to verse 7 through 8, we can see these elements. He's, he's a covenant maker. You are the Lord, God who chose Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham. 
God is a, is, a, is a covenant maker and he keeps his promises. Every promise he makes, he keeps. Number seven, I got 26 of these, so hold on and I'll finish them up really quick. Here we go. He's the, he's the divine deliverer. You brought him, Abraham, out of Ur and the Chaldees. He brought Abraham at a time when he was living in bondage to what? To, to idols. His family were, were not we're not worshiping the God, the Creator, and what happened? God brought him out. He brought him out and gave him a covenant. He, he's the divine deliverer. He brought Abraham out. Number eight, he's faithful. You kept your promises, and God always keeps his promises. Number nine, he's righteous. He alone is righteous. There is none other righteous but him. Verse 9 through 12, he's the, he's the miraculous way maker. We love that song. He's a way maker. Let me tell you, he, he did miracles in the past. He's doing miracles now. He's always doing miracles. I stand before you. You know my testimony, many of you. I stand before you today because God miraculously healed me and saved me. He saved me. He, he miraculously healed me. Broken back, broken, a dislocated shoulder, broken wrist, stage four lymphoma cancer. What does he do? He brings me out and he delivers me and he saves me and he sustains me for what I'm doing even today. He's a way maker. He, and, and these people are praying and as they're praying, they're saying all the miracles God did at that time, he can still do today. He's glorious. Your name... Uh, you made a name for yourself, and he is glorious. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is, is, um, is Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We need to remember that. One day, all your enemies will bow before Jesus Christ. One day, we will be victorious over everything on this earth. He's powerful. You divide the seas. He's, he's he, in his creation, in, 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 in delivering the children of Israel out of the Egypt. What do you do? He divides the seas and they walk across on dry land and they, they recall that in their verbal processing of prayer. He's judged. You cast your, their, their pursuers into the depths. God still today is judging. He will continue to judge. That's a whole other sermon on judging because no one likes to be judged. And you're probably judging me by thinking I'm judging you. So, but we won't go there. He, he's a leader. How did he lead the children of Israel? As in, in this prayer, he led them by a pillar of, 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 of fire and a cloud. He's still a leader today. But you know what? We've lost track of the light that needs to shine in our pathway and give us the direction to go. He's a lawgiver, verses 13 through 15. You gave the rules, the laws, the statutes, and the commandments. Number 16, he's a Sabbath granter. You know this, and, and, and I love this. God created, and on the sixth day he gave rest, and in his law, what did he do? He said there is a Sabbath, there's a day of rest. This, this also is a way to prove that you are not a slave. A slave works seven days a week. A free man has a Sabbath. We need to have a Sabbath. He's a generous giver. You gave bread from heaven and water out of the rock, and, 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 the, and he brought them into a land that gave them so much. Jesus, our God, is a generous giver. Nehemiah chapter 16, uh, or chapter 9, verses 16 through 19. Number 18, God, you are God. You are a God. You are a God ready to forgive. You're a good God. He's good. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and not forsaking them. Number 19, God is merciful. In our great mercy, in your great mercy, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. 
Oh man, the rejection that, that, that the children of Israel rejected God with and then for him not to reject them but to fulfill the promise that he'd given. Verses 20 through 21. Number 20, he's spirit. You gave your spirit. Number 21, he's a family sustainer. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Have we lost track that our God is a sustainer? Have we, have we begun to Realize, have we begin to think that we're responsible for sustaining ourselves? Yeah, you have, a, you have a responsibility to work and to do what God has called you to do, but in reality, God is the one that truly sustains you. He sustains you. Verses 23 through 25, he's a child maker. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. So many times we think it's all about the biology and chemistry and this that has given us life on this earth. But let me tell you, there is nothing, there is no life without God holding everything together. There is no God. Oh, this all, this universe just, just happens to stay like it is by no power at all? No, it's the God of the universe. It's the God creator that gives life and sustains life. He's the enemy crusher, number 23. Um, went in and possessed the land, and you subdued and inhabited the land. They captured, uh, they captured fortified cities in rich land and took possession of houses full of all goods. He's an enemy crusher. You need to remember that too. When, you, when you're under attack, you need to remember God is who you go to to crush your enemy. You don't crush your enemies. So many times, and, and I'm guilty of it, just like many of you, we want to fix it. I'm going to take care of this person. I'm going to take care of this. But in reality, God comes in and says, I, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Pray for your enemies. Verses 26 through 31. He's a disciplining father. They did evil again. You abandoned them to the hands of their enemies. Yet when they turned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Some things you go through are things that you created in your life. And there are times that you go through stuff that God is leading you through them to discipline you and change you. I had a conversation with somebody, uh, it's probably been in the last couple of weeks, and I said, I, I believe you're continuing to experience some of the things you, you're experiencing because they just keep happening in your life, and I think, I think some of it is you're not responding appropriately when these things come up in your life, and you need to, you need to fix that and then I can see these things going away in your life. Boy, they got quiet. Nehemiah chapter 9, 32 through 33. The last one. No, did I do? He's a discipline. I forgot 25. 25, he's a constant savior. Constant savior. This is important because this is one of the answers on your on the kids' sheets. He's a constant Savior. God is merciful. It says, your grace, your great mercy, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. See, grace is where we get what we do not deserve. And mercy is where we don't get what we do deserve. I'll say that again for those that, that, that are struggling with their sheet of paper right now. Grace is where we get what we do not deserve, and mercy is where we don't get what we do deserve. God has been merciful to us. They prayed it, prayed it in Nehemiah chapter 9, and we need to pray it in our day, every day. I am, God has been so merciful to me. So merciful to me. 
You say, Tracy, you're such a good guy. No, I am not. Don't ask my mom. She'll tell you how good I am. But don't, but ask my sister. <laughs> God has been merciful to me. And God is merciful to you. And the last thing, number 26, I didn't think I'd do it, but here it is, number 26. God is a sin forgiver. He's a sin forgiver. And that should get you excited because every one of us need to realize that we're a sinner that needs a savior. We've all done wrong. We've all had sins of omission and commission. We've done things we shouldn't have done and we've, we've not done things we should do. And God sees that. He knows your heart. I'm glad I don't know your heart. He knows your thoughts. I'm glad you don't know my thoughts. I, I, that's just the way it is, guys. We're sinners that need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. Our good works, our good deeds, our, our religious activities can never save us, but God can save us. God can save us. He can deliver us. He can change us. He can make us anew in Him. If we will what? If we will repent and believe. If we will repent and re believe. In Nehemiah chapter 9, I'm going to go to the last uh, uh, verse there, verse 38, 938. It says this, because of all this, and I am closing, guys, I know. It's happening really soon, really fast. Because of all of this, we make a firm commitment in writing on the sealed documents are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our prince, priests. See, there comes a time when you've got to make a commitment. You've got, to, you've got to stand and you say, Lord, I'm giving all of this to you. What will you do with it? And I'll tell you what he's going to do with it. He's going to change you. But I don't, I don't want to be changed. I kind of enjoy this. Well, let me tell you, if you're enjoying something that's outside of, of, of the will of God for your life, then ultimately you've got a problem. God needs to change it in your life. He needs to change you. These people, 141 years of dead religion, transitioned in just a short time into dynamic revival because they were repentant and they recognized who God is. The problem we have in our world today is we've stopped recognizing who God is. We don't need God. We got this. We, we got this until, until something bad happens in our life. We got, we got this. We, we can handle just about everything. But God wants to tell you, you can't handle everything. There's some things that's in our future as a church and as believers that you, you, you can't even fathom right now. I look at my grandkids, my three precious grandkids, and I always wanted to leave a better world than I came into. I'll tell you what I can do. I can leave a better church than I came into. You say, are you dogging your, your dad's ministry? No, I'm not dogging anybody's ministry. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm going to make the church the best church that it can be, and I want my grandkids to carry it on. My dad did that in 1977. He started a church in Bonner Springs in 1970. Church burned in 76 and 78 they rebuilt a building at the time it was wonderful it was great we really seen some fantastic growth and everything in 88 he bought this land they bought the church bought this land up here on the hill and ultimately you know what I came in 2008 2010 I, and it was my goal I want to build a better facility for
for the next generation. And you say, does that save anybody? No, it, it doesn't, but it gives us an opportunity to touch people's lives that we would not have touched before. We're here today because a group of people recognized who God is. They repented of their sins, they believed in God, and they made God and his house a priority. And in Nehemiah's time, there were a group of people that came in after the walls were built and they put a no priority in their lives to secure, the, secure Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And they did that so that Jesus Christ could come and fulfill the prophecy of coming into the temple. There is a reason, and there's a reason for this today. There's a reason for this today. I gotta tell you, there is a God. He is real. He is here today. His spirit is here today. And here's your choice. Here's your chance. In Nehemiah chapter nine, verse five, here it is. I'm not gonna read the names. You can read the names. She may put them up there. I'm not capable right now. But you go through those names and they're important people and their names need to be acknowledged. But those people recognize there is a God and God, and that God is all these 26 things that we're getting ready to pray about. That is our God. And here's what he says. About halfway through it says this, Stand up and bless the Lord. 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 Stand up and bless the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome back. If you want to be more than just uh, click on the screen or more than just friends on the computer, we got an opportunity for you. That's right. There are so many ways that you can get involved here at The Hill. Check out our website, thehillministries.church, and you can find out all that we have going on. There's something for everybody. You can find out what we have through the events tab, and if you feel led to give, you can join us in ministry that way by giving at thehillministries.church slash give, or you can download the Secure Give app and search for The Hill Ministries, or join us in person next time and give in person. And if you would like to share a praise report, a prayer request, or just want to connect with us, you can email us at office at thehillministries.church. Thank you, and have a great rest of your week. God bless.